gospel. Flip over to Matthew 25. Um, for my second anniversary, uh, my wife and I went to New York to uh, see the ball drop. My wife had been there a couple times before. Uh, she saw Dick Clark in the, in, the, uh, in the elevator at the age of 14. Uh, whoever she was with, uh, she went with some friends, and uh, they were at the uh, ripe old age of 14 allowed to go around by themselves in New York City on New Year's Eve. Um, times are different, but I still think back in uh, whenever that was, 1996, seven, five, whatever, um, th that borders on just pure negligence. <laughs> So anyway, she made it and was able to go again. Uh, I think also ventured out with her friends without parental guidance that trip as well. And, uh, but uh, I was by her side uh, in, in our second anniversary. So she had experienced the ball drop. Uh, that was a bucket list for me, but I'm not big into big crowds, uh, nor am I into uh, waiting in the subway for an hour and a half to get back to our, our hotel. Uh, so we were positioned uh, down the way, we weren't kind of what you would see on the on the national broadcasts, but we were kind of off to the side, down what I can't remember, maybe like four or five blocks. Uh, but we were shoulder to shoulder with people, so we kind of had an adjacent view of the ball drop where we kind of see it's almost like a half moon uh, as it came down uh, the side of this building. But what we could see was the confetti spewing out the side. Uh, but as soon as that confetti uh, spewed out from the side, I said, let's go. And we turned. <laughs> And uh, we walked, and we were one of the first people on the subway train uh, off to, to Brooklyn, Williamsburg, where we were, we were staying. But it was kind of like, check that box. Um, but it was amazing to be there and uh, to see it and to see people uh, anticipate and to be watchful. And for people who were, you know, you know, no one's nodding off to sleep, but for those who were distracted in conversation would quickly get the, uh, the, the arm knock or get to your shoulder to, to look, and everybody readjusted themselves quickly uh, to see all that happen. And that might be the case for you too, even tonight as you're watching the ball drop or maybe you watch it in London so you can go to bed at eight o'clock, uh, whatever it may be, or watch the one in Australia, which is happening uh, in about 30 minutes, uh, I think, all right? Actually, it's probably already happened, right? Yeah, Australia, yeah, whatever. So you can YouTube that, you can do YouTube the live streams, whatever it may be. Uh, we'll have a celebration in the cul-de-sac with our neighborhood so our kids can get to bed at a good time. But I remember many New Year's Eve uh, evenings begging my parents to be able to stay up and watch the ball drop at midnight. And I remember most of the time not making it, meaning I fell asleep. And there were a couple occasions where I tell my dad, hey, if I fall asleep, just wake me up, like wake me up right before I need to. And so as a kid, if I ever saw the ball drop, it's because I was anticipating, I was trying, and someone woke me up at the last minute so that I could see the ball drop. So tonight, that may be your story, um, but it, like today and all, every hour, the ball's dropping somewhere, and people are watching and anticipating hitting the 12 on, on the clock. And that is somewhat of a good illustration for us, and some way it ends, because when we talk about being watchful, God talks about and encourages us to be watchful, but some major difference for tonight is in play is that we know when 12 o'clock comes. But where God calls us to be watchful, we don't know when that proverbial ball will drop. We don't know when the confetti will spew. And in, in biblical terms, we don't know when the clouds will, re will roll back. We don't know when the trump will sound. But like the knock on your shoulder, or like my dad saying, Jonathan, wake up, it's time there will be a trumpet blast that will have everyone awake. Whether you've gone, you will be resurrected, the trump will sound, and Jesus will come. And he tells his disciples, and he tells uh, them throughout chapters 24 and 25, and I thought it was appropriate to look at Matthew 25, because last Sunday, if you are with us, uh, when we were at Christmas Eve, we were looking at the birth of Christ, and what that meant. And that fear not is a, is a moment where we have fear and the alarm of the realities of who God is met quickly with the encouragement that with Jesus being your Savior, there is no need to fear anything. Because what he came to do will solve all of our most concerning issues. 
that in a billion years, all you'll care about is if you're with God. You will not care about what troubles you today. You will not care about what troubles you in 10 years. You will not care about your football team's record. You will not care about your IRA. You will not care about the appreciation and eventual depreciation of your homes. You will not care. You will only care about where you are with God or not. And that perspective and that anticipation and watchfulness, I am the first person in line to say that that's not on my mind. That I'm watchful for a lot of other things. Right? Good and bad. I'm watchful for the next round of bad news for our country or political scene or news here in local Roanoke. Those things I anticipate and I look out for. You, are, you all who have to go back to work, perhaps uh, on, on, on Tuesday, uh, whatever it may be, you're watchful for your alarm clock to get back to work where maybe you haven't had to watch that alarm clock for the last couple of days. That's a good thing to be watchful for. It might be a bad thing to be watchful for. I don't know. But we are watchful for things. We're watchful for the milestones in our families. Watchful for, uh, we, were, we were all gathered at my house. The leadership group was gathered at our house yesterday. Uh, little Leah was, uh, was hanging on to the coffee table on her tippy toes, and she's starting to kind of, uh, you know, what do you, I don't know what you call that. Scoot? Scoot? That's called scooting? Oh, okay. I thought scooting was on your rear, but okay. But scooting. And it's kind of this watchful anticipation of, like, Leah's first steps. I don't, I don't, that's, that's a fun thing. Uh, I remember seeing that in, in our kids. There's a lot, of cool, a lot of cool things. But we're watchful for those things. But what God will call us to be watchful for and be reminded of that this morning is that we need to be people who are anticipating and are watchful and our priorities are clearly watchful for the coming of God's kingdom. And if we are people who are watchful, it puts a lot of things into perspective very quickly. It's not something uh, where we can be a people who fall asleep and then get suddenly woken up for like I was as a, chi- as a child for New Year's Eve. And we'll read a text that highlights all this. So if you're not there already, Matthew 25, we're going to read um, the parable of the ten virgins through 1 through 13 this morning. Again, entitled Watchful. And there are a few things that we can learn from all this as we look into and watch to see what God will do in 2024. Amen? Amen. So Matthew 25, verse 1. It reads, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Again, this text uh, is in a, in a series of texts in Matthew 24 and 25. The, the sheep and the goats, the parable of the bags of gold, and then prior even this to Matthew 24. Uh, again, a similar watchful vibe about the coming of the kingdom of God and and Jesus even saying to his disciples in Matthew 24, I don't even know the hour. I don't even know. So God's even, uh, Jesus' humanity is on display there too. But uh, I do want to dissect this a little bit for us because there's definitely some allegories and some metaphors and there's a lot of misinterpretation of this text over the years through many commentaries and books that you and and I may have read that uh, puts a little bit more emphasis on certain things that really had no place uh, for the disciples who are hearing this. So again, kind of reading this through Eastern eyes, if you will. Um, anyway, so one, for, for example, this is a marriage scene, which again, 
uh, would have taken the course of many days. Weddings in, in, in Palestine is a weekly affair, uh, not traditionally like ours, which are one day or maybe a, a, a groom honoring or something before that, a wedding reception and then the wedding. This is a whole ordeal. So the, the introduction, the emphasis is actually on the bridegroom here. We put a lot of emphasis on the bride, which is cool, and there's the bride of Christ, but the bridegroom gets the, gets the emphasis here, which I think we could redo our weddings and kind of get a little bit more, a little bit more shine, right? now. anyway, no, it is the bridegroom of Christ, but, or the bride of Christ, but the bridegroom here is what's being anticipated. And the normal cultural reality is that you have the bridegroom, the, the, the wedding has actually already occurred, and now they're, they're transitioning back to the bridegroom's home. And for the Palestinians at this time, uh, timing, it, it wasn't a big emphasis culturally. So it's kind of like when he shows up, he shows up. It's not like he's going to be there. We've got the reception hall from 3 o'clock to 4.30. Uh, we got to get started. It's like, hey, there's a party. It's going to be back at the bridegroom's house. Be ready. Whenever he shows up, he shows up. So the, the virgins here are most likely bridesmaids. It's a, the idea of them being virgins doesn't have anything to do uh, with anything. It's, it's just a sen sense of a grouping, a pairing, that, or a, a grouping that, that Jesus is making here. But the bride maids, these virgins, their responsibility was to look out for the bridegroom and then go out and meet him with their torch torches or oil lamps and actually usher him back in to the party. So their job was to light the way for the bridegroom's appearance. And again, we see in this story, it took a long time. And there's nothing, and there's no moral fault of these brides, bridesmaids or the virgins falling asleep. It's, it has nothing to do with this. So even for us, if you want to look at this allegorically, you think, oh, don't fall asleep spiritually. You stay awake the whole time. Jesus is actually not making that point at all. Now, we understand that people fall asleep or you drift away or the disciples fell asleep in the garden and Jesus is like, can you not stay up one hour? You can try to find text to prove that don't fall asleep spiritually is included here in Matthew 25, but all the point of them falling asleep, the point is it took a long time. That's it. That's all it's there for. It takes a long time. And the truth is the coming of our bridegroom in Jesus has taken a long time and we don't, we don't know when he'll come back. But the point is, be ready, be watchful. And their task was to make sure they had enough oil to have their lamps not necessarily be lit all night long, but to actually have enough oil to be lit to go meet him and then to carry out the procession to the party. That's it. So allegorically, you can look at this and say, oil, what is oil? Some people say it's grace. Some people think it's gratitude, that your oil runs out, your good works run out. That's not biblical at all. All right. Because why do we know that? They are asked to go buy more oil. Can you buy grace? Can you buy good works? Can you buy your way to, to persevere? No, sir. No, ma'am. So anyone that says this is about staying on task spiritually enough to make it, well, that implies that you've got to do X, Y, Z to earn your, your place in the procession. No, no, this is all about I'm anticipating, I'm waiting, I trust that the bridegroom is coming, and my life is living in anticipation of that. And when we do, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. So for these, these, uh, these bridesmaids, these virgins, five have enough, five don't. What we imply here, what the parable implies, is that these women who did not have enough had enough to light their lamps, but that rag, which many people believe was, was uh, coming out of these little clay pots or perhaps, perhaps a torch like Indiana Jones, you wrap the, wrap the stick with, uh, with, the, with the cloth and it's drenched in oil, that their cloth had dried up. And they did not have enough oil for perhaps for it to get started, but it wasn't going to make it. To, to meet him and bring him back. So they're asking, hey, can we have some of yours? The story's pretty straightforward. They say no, because we got to make sure we have enough. This story also has nothing to do with Christian kindness. Like, why didn't they share? That's so, so unchristian-like. How could they be 
faithful disciples and not help out their fellow bridesmaids. They needed to share. Sharing is caring. No, no, no. That's not actually what this parable is about. That there's no moral, there's no moral sin of the five bridesmaids who are like, hey, sorry about your luck. I, I, the bridegroom is that important that I need to make sure my lamp doesn't go out. That's the reality. What good will it be if I share my oil with you and then all ten lamps go out? That's the, that's the meaning of those comments. He needs light. We're going to do it. We're not going to sacrifice what actually this bridegroom procession demands and needs and is required. So there are solutions. With a wedding, this is not just like down at the, down at the, uh, the reception hall and everybody else is asleep. When there's a wedding in town, it's the whole town. So for these women, they're not being sarcastic, like, why don't you go buy some? <laughs> it's midnight. Why don't you go buy some? I'm sure somebody's open. Ha. No, no, no. The reality is somebody was. Somebody was. You could go buy oil. And it even implies in the story that they actually did go find oil and came back and what? It's too late. It was too late. All right? So there's a lot of different things uh, in, in this text that are, that are fun um, and not so fun. The, uh, the fun ones are what I just talked about. The not so fun is that these folks, these five, go and find their oil. And in verse 10, when they come back, the wedding banquet, the door was shut. And these comments that, that Matthew includes here in Jesus' parable, verse 11, Lord, Lord, sounds very similar, actually identical to another text in Matthew 7 where Jesus says, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. The, those, that type of recognition of who the bridegroom is, who he, who he is, what he stands for, that's not enough for God. That's not enough. Your, your, your association with him or your recognition of him is clearly not enough in this parable. He says there in verse 12, truly I tell you, I don't know you. This doesn't mean that I have no acquaintance with you, that I don't, I'm not even sure what you're doing here. Uh, who are you again? It has nothing to do with that. It's simply you weren't prepared. So therefore the acknowledgments, uh, it, you, you're not ready, so we're moving. And that's, that's the sting. This isn't meant to be like, oh man, that's, oh, that's, that's harsh. Yeah, it is. It is. And Jesus isn't at fault here, and the parable is, is a parable. So there, Jesus in verse 1, the kingdom of heaven will be like. This is what the kingdom of heaven will be like. God's going to come back. We don't know when. Be watchful. Because if we're not watchful, we might miss it. And in this story, there's something to be said about being prepared. There's something about to be said about you can't use anybody else's oil, let's call it faith, you can't use anybody else's faith to help you be prepared. That at the end of the day, it's you and your bridegroom. It's me and the bridegroom. There are no coattails into the kingdom of heaven. And with all the shakeup in Christendom and even our fellowship of churches, too many of us have fallen victim to watching other people's faith rather than digging and being watchful ourselves. And without a, without a fault, without a, without, a, without a doubt rather, those will be surprises for us when life comes at us and we're like, whoa, 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 and things shake and things get weird and people are people. And if we're not anticipating the kingdom, we'll in a sense be unprepared. For our bridegroom. So this is meant to be scary. Sorry for the downer, New Year's Eve. But we all watch. We are all very watchful for 2024. We will all be very watchful for that clock. We'll be all very watchful for our New Year's resolutions. We'll be very watchful for an election year this year. We'll be very watchful for a lot of things. Vacations, trips you have planned, calendar events, things you're scribbling in, penciling in, putting in ink about what's going to happen in 2024 retirement, new venues, new opportunities, new friendships, new places, travel, all great things to be watchful for. But if it supersedes watching for the kingdom, 
we may find ourselves out of oil. So that's the bad news. The good news is he hasn't come back yet. Which means there's time and there's opportunity for us and our hearts to be repentant, to be reoriented, to be people who anticipate and watch for God. It's unexpected. It's been a long time. You read the New Testament and you think about the disciples in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul's addressing. He talks about how many have fallen asleep in the Lord. And it goes on to talk about how some people have believed the resurrection has already occurred and have led people astray. People were getting antsy 2,000 years ago. Even in Paul's writing, there was an anticipation that it could be really soon. So for me, that's like, oh, man, if it's another 2,000 years, okay, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of paradise. That sounds good. However, that's a long time, and that could lead many astray. The, uh, the wise bridesmaid in this story, which we've emphasized, are the people we want to be. We want to be the wise bridesmaid in this story. We know that the comings and goings, even as we plan in 2024, it's going to be sudden. Consider Genesis 6 uh, through chapter 8 when it comes to Noah and the flood. God told Noah, this is how it's going to be when the flood comes. People will be eating lunch, enjoying company, going through their routine, and to their surprise, the flood will come. So the second coming is, is, is symbolic of Noah, that we're going to be eating lunch, we're going to be having our parties and our hangouts. We're going to be doing our routine. You may be driving to work. You might be checking out. You might be on vacation. You might be watching Netflix. You might, who knows? Now, we don't get all crazy and say, it's going to happen in 2024. I'm not that guy. I'm not going on record for, record for that. But what I, what I do know is that it could happen. And if I'm honest, I don't think about it. I don't. I don't think about it. I think about a lot of other things happening. Think about meetings, think about Bible studies, think about things with my kids, schedules with their sports activities, think about groceries and bills and all the things you got to think about. But Jesus' return in the kingdom should be priority number one. It should be the number one thing I'm looking for, anticipating. Not even anticipating or looking for, but what God tells us here is that we should be longing for it. Consider 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, where at the end of Paul's life, this is what he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. There's something to be said about a longing for that appearing. Not just a, eh, yeah, I'm kind of looking out for it, or I'm scared of it, or I hope it doesn't come. I've quoted this so many times, Kenny Chesney, everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to go right now. Right? This sen that sense of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all down for heaven. I just kind of want to get my MBA first, or I, you know, I kind of want to make sure I, I'm a millionaire. I, I just really want to go to DR and go to Punta Cana and check that out. I, I really want to get a truck, and I really want to see my kids graduate, and I want to dance with my daughter at her wedding. There's a lot of things I want to do, but if I want to do those things more than see the kingdom come back and be a part of it, I'm not longing for his appearing, and if there's something else you're more passionate about, I'm here to tell you, in 2023, let's end that and start in 2024, where your most passionate desire is to see the kingdom come. It has to be. You want our community to change? Long for his appearing. This doesn't mean get rid of all those folks. Let's just get it over with. This means if the kingdom's coming, people need to be ready. If the kingdom's come, if it's on the way, that means there's reconciliation that needs to occur. That means there's opportunities to love my neighbor. This is in context of Matthew 25, where it goes on to tell you, this is what it looks like for someone who's longing for his appearing. If you see someone that's thirsty, you gave him a drink of water. If you saw someone in jail, you went to visit them. This is, these are the marks of people who
who know the kingdom is coming. That there's opportunity to love and show the love of Christ. Let's get after it. Let's be about it. It reorganizes all of my priorities. You know, for an example, that again also falls short. We scheduled a C-section for Natalie, so she doesn't count. But when Cameron was born, we knew when she was coming. But when Cameron was born, uh, we had a general date, like most people do. Like, yeah, it'll be kind of like the end of June. And we're like, okay, cool. We planned for that time. We didn't know the exact day, but every one of our priorities shifted. Would we have loved to go on vacation? Sure. But ain't no one having a baby on a plane, so not happening. Right? Would we have loved to, to, to travel and do some other things, to commit? Let's walk a 5K. We aren't doing that anyway. But no, no, no. No, we cannot. Hey, you want to go here? Nope. Lindsay's, Lindsay's, you know, about to pop any day. We packed a bag. Meaning if it were like, hey, honey, it's time. We weren't like, oh, wasn't expecting that. It's here's the bag. Gas is in the car. Let's roll. We know our doctor. We know where we're going. We know the trip. Everything was planned. Did we know the exact hour? No. Even when we thought we did, he was born 45 hours later. Longest pregnancy I've been a part of. <laughs> but it changed our priorities. Everything we did was with that in mind. Can I commit to that? Well, if my wife goes into labor, I probably should be closer. Oh, yeah, I want to, no, I can't do that lunch appointment because my wife could go into labor in any moment. No, I'm actually not going to go do what I want to do. Let me go play a round of golf for four hours. No, 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 no. My wife might go into labor. I need to be ready. And if you think about that from a spiritual lens, how does longing for God's appearing rearrange your priorities? In light of his coming, how does that rearrange what you invest in? How you go about your day? What is important to you? Those things change. And I love my son. And him being born was a big deal. But comparatively, may I? Jesus coming back in my preparedness for that, my son's birth pales in comparison. But I saw his sonogram. I heard his heartbeat. We bought the clothes. I made the crib. I was in love with my son before I ever met him. I wasn't afraid. It wasn't what was driving me. I was fearful that something could go wrong. But I loved my son before he showed up. So my watchfulness was motivated out of my love to meet him. It wasn't, oh no, I'm gonna be afraid, I'm afraid to be a dad, which I was, because no one can prepare you for that. But I wasn't like, he's here, I'm gonna, oh my goodness. It was, I love this boy. I can't wait to meet him. I'm prepared, I'm watchful, I don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to happen or what's going to happen to my wife, but I'm motivated to do all I need to do to be prepared because I love this boy. In the same way, our watchfulness is not motivated out of, I don't want to miss out, I don't want to be like those five, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure my oil is filled to the brim because I don't want to see, I don't want to hear that, that's scary, that's scary, that's scary. Last Sunday I said, fear is a great showstopper, but it's a terrible motivator. We are motivated, and we are able to persevere because of Christ's love for us. Not our fear for Christ compels us. That's garbage. And I've been there too many times to count. When Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 4, for all those who have longed for his appearing, unfortunately it implies that some aren't. All of us who are implies that some aren't longing, longing for his appearing. You know, New Year's resolutions are fun. I want to add, add one that I honestly have not had. Is to contemplate every day what would be different if I'm longing for his appearing. What would I think about if I was longing for his appearing? Jonathan Edwards, who's the hellfire and brimstone Puritan preacher back in New England. Mike might have lived in his house, honestly. Another scare. 
He's got an old house in Boston. It's possible. Anyway, his resolutions were this. I resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Think about that. Christ's longing, longing for his appearing. We've said this in jest, and some of it's not the greatest motivation. You don't want to be caught doing that when Jesus comes back. You want to be caught watching that movie and Jesus comes back? You know, you can think of your grandma showing up in your, in your room as a kid, like, I wouldn't be listening to DMX if Jesus was coming back. I'd be like, oh, you're right, Grandma. You're right. That was a long time ago. I haven't listened to him in a while. But Jonathan Edwards is saying, you know what? Sin would lose its appeal if I was longing for his appearing. Why would I want to do that if I can't wait to meet my God? Think about how crazy it would be. You'd slap me across the face and then down the other. Karen, you would. If I was in the hospital, my wife's in labor in the other room, Cameron's going to be born any moment, and I'm out flirting with the girl in the hallway. Right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Thank you. Right? Or if my son was about to be born, I'm anticipating, and all of a sudden I'm more focused on the eagle score than being, being attendant to my wife. Or if my joy, yeah, touchdown, babies cry like, oh, oh cool, yeah. <laughs> like, you'd be like, what's wrong with that guy? That guy's priority, like he doesn't understand the magnitude of what can, is about to happen, that he's overjoyed about that. And I think that's so true of my life. And this doesn't mean you can't get happy about anything. Or now you just got to be still and be in a corner and blow. Like, any moment, any moment, any moment. Oh, great birthday. Who cares? You know, Jesus, it's not no joy. But it's a perspective. And it's an anticipation that's on our, on our minds. So to dream and to imagine for each and every one of us, how would you live differently today if you knew Jesus was coming back? tonight not a weird question if will he probably not but if he does i don't know i say this to online because i don't think anybody's doing it here but how would your new year's eve celebration be if jesus could come back i doubt you drink as much right how would the Roanoke Valley Church, live out the kingdom if each and every one of us anticipated and was longing for the kingdom. I think we'd be more eager to stay connected. Each and every disciple would, would want to be connected to help each other long for the kingdom, to remind each other of what it's really all about. I think there'd be more conversation with our neighbors and our friends about the greatest longing you have. For me, there would be drastic repentance, priorities, holiness, my conversations, what I get irritated about. Things would just, God, please give me perspective. I'd be eager to find new ways to live out the kingdom of heaven with my family, with the church, with my neighbors and the community. Versus living out my own schedule with my little family unit, making sure we get done what we want to do. But rather taking a step back and saying, this is the kingdom of heaven. God wants to usher this in. How can I help live this out? There's no way around it. I would have a healthier urgency for others' relationship with God. I wouldn't be afraid of how I looked talking about my greatest longing. I wouldn't be afraid, maybe as afraid, to talk to the random clerks at Kroger or wherever you get your groceries about what they're longing for. It's a great question if you don't want to be ultra-religious. Hey, Happy New Year. What are you longing for this year? And they'll probably say, well, what are you longing for? And you may say, um, I'm longing for vacation. However, my greatest longing is 
and it might be a good segue. But for us, practically, that one question I want, I pray for my heart and for all of you, when we ring in the new year, that question is ringing in our ears. What would today look like if I was longing for his appearing? And then I encourage us in practice to just read the rest of Matthew 25 at some point in the next couple of days. And these are your practical implications that Jesus doubles down on. Say, this is what it looks like to be ready. How we interact with our neighbors, how we use our gifts, how you use the spiritual gifts you have, how you use your strengths, how you use your wonderful talents, how you use your career to bring the kingdom. If you're longing for the appearing, the sheep and the goats is the next parable. The bag of gold is you've been given ability. Well, you'll use it for the kingdom because you're longing for what's going to last well longer than your life and your career. The sheep and the goats, you'll look, and I will look at people who are hungry, falsely imprisoned, you name it, injustice, left and right, needing clothes, needing help, needing love, needing a hug, needing a conversation, needing a smile, needing some of your lunch, needing some, whatever it is, but I'll look to anticipate how can I usher in the kingdom here? Because this kingdom is all that's going to remain. And I want this person to experience it. So in practice, answer the question. Let it ring in your ears. What will today, how will today be different if I'm longing for his appearing? And then read Matthew 25 and reflect on the practical implications as to how we long how it changes our perspective, how it changes our actions, how it changes what we use, even of ourselves. Amen? I'm excited about 2024. I'm excited about the priorities that will be shifted and the opportunities that God will help us see as we long for his appearing. Let us be watchful. Enjoy your New Year's Eve. Enjoy 2024. And we can't wait to enjoy his appearing. Amen? Please stand for a final song.